happy to welcome all of you to this afternoon session. Uh, I know you're, it's right after lunch, so you're starting to kind of fade a little bit, but uh, I think you're in for a treat in, in hearing about community health centers and federally qualified health centers. So welcome all of you today. Um, my name is Danny Wong Tomiyasu. I'll be your moderator for this afternoon session. And um, we're here to really talk about federally qualified health centers, or also known as federally funded community health centers. Um, they have always been a critical safety net for our healthcare system. And by design, FQHCs are at the very center of implementation of the Affordable Care Act and are a central component to Hawaii's healthcare system. They are really keenly positioned um, to provide critical access to comprehensive and integrated preventative and primary care services that are a central part of our healthcare system and of ACA. With the expansion of healthcare coverage and the expansion of Hawaii's Medicaid eligibility, there is even a greater need for FQHC's comprehensive and integrative preventative and primary care services now more than ever. FQHCs have been working tireless, tirelessly for the past five or more years to transform their health centers to meet the many challenges before them in this new healthcare environment and to continue to meet the needs of their underserved communities. I'm excited to introduce you to today's panel who will share what they've done and are doing to gear up and transform the health centers to deliver better care, better health, and reduce costs. So to my right, uh, we have Robert Hirakawa, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Hawaii Primary Care Association. Mr. Hirakawa currently serves as the Chief Executive Officer of the Hawaii Primary Care Association, as well as the President of the Hawaii Public Health Association. Previous to his employment with the HPCA, he served as the lead epidemiologist for the Department of Health Science, Health Science Research Group. The health the Hawaii Diabetes Prevention and Control Program, and the Hawaii State Asthma Control Program. He received his Master's of Public Health degree in Epidemiology and a Doctorate in Public Health from the University of Hawaii. Next to Robert, we have Via Segal, who is the Chief Quality Officer of the Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center. In addition to her responsibilities as CQO, Dr. Segal has been practicing pediatrics at the health center for over 20 years. A strong advocate for community health centers and the vulnerable patients they serve, Dr. Segal is very active with the Hawaii Primary Care Association and the National Association of Community Health Centers. Her areas of interest include demonstrating the role of CHCs that uh, play in addressing preventable costs of healthcare and validating the need to risk adjust for social determinants of health and patient complexity. She earned degrees from the University of Miami, University of Hawaii in epidemiology, and the University of Michigan, her MPH. And finally, we have Richard Taff, who is the executive director of West Hawaii Community Health Center. As the first executive of the West Hawaii Community Health Center, Mr. Taff has seen the agency grow from a single site and six staff to four sites and 100 staff serving 11,500 patients. He serves on several nonprofit boards, including the Kona Community Hospital, Hawaii Primary Care Association, Aloha Care, and Health Choice Network of Florida. He also chairs HPCA's Patient Center Medical Home Steering Committee and is a member of the Mayor's Health Care Task Force on the Big Island. Originally from New Mexico, Mr. Taff has a master's degree from the University of Mexico and a BA from Algany College and attended the University of Manchester in England. So I give to you our first presenter, Robert Hirokawa. Thanks, Danny. Um, when I was at the Department of Health, I was in the uh, Chronic Disease Management and Control Branch. And Danny was my former boss. <laughs> now I'm the CEO of the HPCA, and I have two board members there. So all, I'm surrounded by my bosses here, so <laughs> pressure's on. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just provide a very brief overview of the Hawaii Primary Care Association and community health centers. And really, I want to give more time to actually to Dr. Villasego and to Richard Taft to talk more about the details 
and specifics about the things that they've done in the recent past. Uh, the re oh, in the past and currently. Okay, so go forward, right? Okay, so the Hawaii Primary Care Association is really a membership organization that is made up of all of Hawaii's community health centers across the state of Hawaii. And we've been in, in uh, inception since 1989. Actually, there's 14 uh, community health centers across the state of Hawaii, with a 15th uh, trying to be born at this current time in Oahu. Now, the mission is very simple. The HPCA improves the health of communities in need by advocating for expanding access to and sustaining high quality health care through our statewide network of community health centers. The, we, we, the role of the PCA is very simple, is actually for a four-step process. We uh, work in advocacy. We also provide technical assistance and training to community health centers across the state. We work in the area of policy and planning, and we also work on funding. And I, I would actually add a fifth, uh, I guess, leg to the stool, and that is we also work on partnerships as well. In terms of community health centers, um, CHCs receive federal grants under the Section 33 of the Public Health Service Act. Uh, community health centers uh, must provide care in an underserved or area or population, in other words, an MUA or an MUP. Uh, and they are all governed by a board of directors which include community health center patients and community members. In 2012, uh, Hawaii's community health centers in total, uh, treated 144,000 patients across the state of Hawaii. And that represents a 23% increase in the patient population that they served uh, since 2008. Uh, so, and this, is, this predates this, this increase in growth, or the growth curve is predates ACA. So we're expecting as ACA becomes, as it is implemented in 2014, we expect that growth to increase even further. Of the 144,000 patients served, 24% uh, were uninsured, 50% were covered by Medicaid, and 73% were at or below the federal poverty level, which in 2012 equates to $27,000 of annual household income for a family of four. In addition, of the 144,000, over 12,000 of those patients were homeless in 2012. Uh, 1,750 were veterans. 30% of the 144,000 were children under the age of 18. 44% were Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. And 8% were best served by another language. And I want to, um, there's a story here that I want to um, explain to you that these statistics really, what it's telling you is that the patients that the community health centers serve are a very, uh, they're a special population with a lot of complex needs. And yet, uh, even with these uh, challenges, the community, community health centers are still able to perform very highly, as you'll see with the two uh, examples that Richard and Avia will present to you. This is where they're located. We have, again, 14 F uh, CHCs across the state of Hawaii. Uh, they occupy all, we have at least one CHC across, uh, on every single island, except for Niihau, one on Kauai, six on the island of Oahu, one on Molokai, one on Lanai, two on Maui, and three on the Big Island. And again, one being, <clears throat> one being born, as we speak, uh, in Wahiwa. Community health centers basically um, focus their efforts on the social determinants of health, and I'll describe that a little later. Uh, they provide enabling services, which include interpretation services, transportation services, education, uh, social services, and so forth. Uh, they are patient-centered. They have been patient-centered for a long time now. And in fact, I would even say that uh, community health centers are actually community-centered. Um, they provide medical, behavioral, and oral health services. They also provide substance abuse treatment and vision care. So the social determinants of health, um, which we think lead to the health, dispar health inequities, basically the social determinants of health are the circumstances in which people are born, grow up, live, work, and age, and the systems put in place to deal with these, with these with illnesses. These circumstances are in turn shaped by a wider set of forces, economic, social policies, and politics. 
And as we know, social determinants of health then lead to health inequities. Health inequities then are avoidable in inequalities in health between groups of people within countries and between within countries and between countries. These inequities arise from inequalities within, the, within and between societies. Social and economic conditions and their effects on people's lives determine their risk of illness and the actions taken to prevent them becoming ill or treat illness when it occurs. In my opinion, to truly transform healthcare, and this is what the whole conference is, is, is about today, is that we must address the social determinants of health it really, in order to eliminate the health inequities that continue to adversely impact certain segments of Hawaii's population. And in my opinion, Hawaii's community health centers, because of their primary focus on the social determinants of health, are an essential component of Hawaii's healthcare infrastructure and play a vital role in transforming our healthcare system. And with that, I'll leave it to Via to continue. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It is so nice to see so many friendly and familiar faces. And uh, I tell you, Dr. Verghese is a hard act to follow. He was very inspiring. And uh, there's so many other. I really thank you for being here. There's. Um, I was telling. Oh, oh look what I'm doing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was telling Danny that. Um, I had signed up for a conflicting session at the same time as this one, um, but I'm unable to attend it because I'm presenting here. So anyway, <laughs> so it goes. That's my life. Um, anyway, I am, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and I really, this is an easy talk to give because this is my passion. I, as Danny said, I have been um, in community health for 20 years. Um, I started working community health because I was interested in international health and I had just had a baby and I thought, okay, I'll do this gig for a while and then I'm gonna go overseas again. And 20 years later, I'm still in Waianae. And, and look at Waianae, I mean, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's really, this is, this is my home when I'm, when I'm not at home in, on the other side of the island. But, um, we have a remarkable health center that we have built over the course of the last 40 years. Um, we serve a very, very um, poor population, a very um, uh, a population that's really affected by a lot of the social determinants of health, which I will also talk about that Robert alluded to, and uh, a very economically distressed population. Um, however, we, we are probably in one of the most beautiful parts of the island, and, and we have a gorgeous health center, and I invite each and every one of you to visit. We serve fish in our dining room that's caught in the ocean right there. I tell you, it's a cheap, it's, it's a good deal. Anyway, come visit, give me a call. Um, I, I can give you my cell phone number just like Herb <laughs> Schultz did. Uh, <laughs> afterwards, come see me afterwards. Um, Hawaii's community health centers have grown so much over the past decade. We now serve, as Robert said, over 144,000 patients, making us the second largest network of primary care in the state. As a response to this shift from safety net to really becoming the backbone for integrated primary care delivery in Hawaii, we have worked hard in the, over the past few years to transform healthcare to a patient-centered model that affirms the triple aim. And we heard about this this morning. We continue to lead or actually navigate healthcare, and this is really one, we wanna shift away from being the safety net and really be called the navigators of healthcare. And in fact, our policy platform that we are going to be putting forth, um, imminently actually, is named Ho'okele, which is the Hawaiian word for navigate. And over the next few years, we really want to make community health centers the focus of this, of this, this effort to navigate us through healthcare transformation. Uh, as Robert said, you know, we, we provide care through a very integrated approach, which I don't need to detail because Robert already did. Um, so I'm going to really talk about the role we play in shaping healthcare transformation and furthermore payment reform and our experience in doing so. With the changing healthcare landscape, it is critical that community health centers are at the forefront of navigating payment reform to the benefit of underserved communities. So this is Wainai, as I said. Um, last year we served over 31,000 individuals through 176,000 encounters. Over 50% of our patients are either Native Hawaiian or from the Pacific Islands, and over 67% of our patients fall below the 100% poverty level. 
uh, we provide value. Community health centers throughout this country provide value. We have years of experience of providing high quality and low cost care to the most vulnerable members of our society. So, and, and, and this belief is supported by others. Community health centers have demonstrated our ability to deliver affordable, comprehensive, coordinated, patient-centered care in facilities physically proximate to the patients who need it. We serve not only families, we not, serve not only individuals, we serve communities. Poor people live shorter lives and are more often ill than the rich. This disparity has drawn attention to the remarkable sensitivity of health to the social environment. This is stated by the World Health Organization. The four most important factors influencing health are not medical. They're whether or not someone lives in poverty or experiences income insecurity. They're whether or not somebody graduates from high school. They're whether or not someone engages in physical activity. And they're whether or not someone smokes. Nothing to do with what we traditionally think of as medicine. The Waianae Coast, our primary service area, has the highest number of households in the state receiving financial aid and food stamps. We have the highest number of obese adults, adults with diabetes, and adult smokers. We have the highest cancer and heart disease mortality rates. So let me just go back again. The four most important factors influencing health and the patient we serve. And this is from uh, the Hawaii Primary Care um, State Department of Health report from last year. Pictures speak a thousand words. I really don't even need to say anything. A beachfront home in Waianae is not quite the same as a beachfront home in Kahala. Just like a healthcare home in Waianae is not the same as a medical home in Kahala. There's a session going on next door, which is the one I wanted to be at, <laughs> which is about, uh, and you can't leave, now you're here, I've got you captive, <laughs> um, which is talking about really just this, just this very factor, the fact that zip code is more important than a genetic code in determining what your health is going to be. There are whole studies going on that, that show that you know, they can look at a person's zip code and actually tell what their, what their uh, mortality rate is going to be. And these are our patients. So this is a typical patient. This is about, you know, we, we did a survey of all of our adult medicine providers and in our internal medicine department, and over 70% of the patients that they serve fall into this highly complex patient category. And this is really, you know, it seems extreme, but it's not. This is a fairly typical patient, one who is morbidly obese with a BMI greater than 40, has uncontrolled diabetes, congestive heart failure and comorbidities to asthma, is depressed, is homeless, thereby requiring transportation services. He's non-compliant with his medication and his diet. He frequently no-shows and instead uh, makes uh, frequent visits to the emergency room. These are many of our patients. Our value is in providing comprehensive, integrated medical care to our patients. Our highly complex patients receive fragmented. Now, this is, this is before. This is what we were faced with and how we're changing. Highly complex patients traditionally receive fragmented medical care at best. They overutilize emergency rooms and hospitals. They consume more resources, take more time to manage effectively, and thus contribute to physician frustration. Community health centers are the ideal patient-centered healthcare home because of the integrated services they provide, as Robert indicated and a core group of well-trained providers who are incentivized to closely follow and provide medical care to complex medical patients is essential. I'm going to be discussing the payment reform plan that we have developed and that we're in, uh, implementing with, with all the major um, health plans here in the state, Medicaid health plans in the state. And uh, the, the need for this incentive plan was actually born from the fact that we were having a real issue with retaining our medical providers, particularly our internists who were taking care of the patient I just showed you before. Um, so we needed to figure out a way to really develop the patient-centered medical home, to develop a competent core of, of people to work with our providers to assist them in caring for these patients. And then we basically set out to develop a payment reform plan that allowed us to invest in increased HIT infrastructure, increased care coordination, um, and allowed us to actually provide better uh, support for our providers and, and incentives for doing so. In, in return, we are promising to actually demonstrate that we are uh, instrumental in cutting the costs of, of emergency room visits, readmissions to hospitals, et cetera. I'll go into that later. So we noted and we felt and we feel very strongly that our savings are in coordinating care for our most complex patients. We feel that payer systems need to recognize the value of the services that community health centers provide 
and we see this as an opportunity to decrease costs and improve care for our patients. We feel that shared risks is akin to shared savings. And so AHARO was born. AHARO is the Accountable Healthcare Alliance of Rural Oahu. This has been the payment reform plan that we have developed, and, and it is really quite unique. Um, I'll go into it in a little detail, but it's all about improving the quality of care and providing value through community partnerships. It's about addressing preventable costs and sharing savings with medical homes and the communities they serve. It's about empowering low-income communities to find new solutions to address their health care needs. Communities with shared values joining together to share ideas and build systems that address common needs. It's about transparency and willingness of healthcare homes to be measured fairly and adjusted for population factors and to maximize resources already funded in healthcare rather than seeking more government support. Sorry, it's a busy slide, but I was limited to only 12, so I had to kind of <laughs> include. They're really strict at this conference. Uh, <laughs> The, um, our AHARO payment reform model, we use a predictive modeling system to identify our most complex patients. Complex being defined by high risk, high cost. But we also, within our predictive model, have been able to incorporate some social determinants of health as well from our own internal uh, records, not just from the claims that uh, most uh, typical predictive modeling systems are based on. We are hoping to focus on addressing the preventable costs. We are, uh, as we said earlier, co-investing with the payers in care coordination and HIT infrastructure to care for our most complex, high-cost patients. We're recognizing the delivery of value-added services. Those are a lot of the services that Robert had mentioned earlier, our enabling services, our transportation services, our translation services, all the things that community health centers do to assist their, their disenfranchised patients. Uh, we've established transparent risk pools and partnerships with the health plans, and we have a 360-degree evaluation of both the health plan and the healthcare home. So these are the preventable costs that we're currently working on. And, um, Actually, it's the plans that we have, um, uh, that we are cooperating with that, that have, have basically provided these metrics to us. Uh, they stated that these are the most expensive patients, and if we could actually assist in, in cutting down these costs, that we would actually have money left over in our risk pool to, to, to save and to share. Um, we are working very hard to decrease our total number of hospitalizations, the total number of hospital days for our patients, our hospital readmissions, and most importantly, our, and we've actually changed this. This is an old slide. We're no longer calling it inappropriate ER use. That's not politically correct. It's low acuity ER use, so I'll change it in my next presentation. And that really makes more sense. I mean, appropriateness, who deems appropriateness? Every patient, when they're sick and need to go to the emergency room, it's an appropriate ER visit in their mind, and I'm not going to dispute that. But when they're seen for low acuity visits in an emergency room, as opposed to by their primary care doctor, that may be something that we could uh, have saved money on. Uh, drug costs, we are hoping to increase our generic medication dispensing rate. And actually, this is the one that we're doing really well on. When we did our baseline assessment, actually, with one plan, we were at like 99%. So it's kind of hard to improve that. The others we have room to improve on. For example, our, our low acuity ER use with one payer is about 17.5%. And so that's one of, the plan, one of the things that we're really, really focusing on. Now we are actually, we've developed a, a care enabling team uh, and a care coordination team that actively calls every single time. We get direct feeds from all the emergency rooms in the state or on Oahu. And and uh, we actually, the next morning, are calling the patients who went to the emergency room for a low acuity visit and are asking them. We're, we're again, not judging. We're asking, why is it that you went to the emergency room? Was it because you couldn't get in to see your doctor? Is it because the, it was after hours? Is it because you were scared? Is it because you don't like your doctor? I mean, so we're, and we're actually asking an open-ended question. So we're letting the patients tell us. So next year, I'll give you the data. Uh, that's, that's our current state. We are really just, just actively starting this process now and, and haven't even had chance to analyze the data yet because we're gathering it. Um, we're hoping to increase our medication adherence, and we're also uh, planning on increasing our advanced healthcare directives on file. So those are the, those are the seven financial metrics we're, we're working on. Community health centers are uniquely positioned to address the needs of the hardest to serve with our model of coordinated care. The system must fairly reimburse health centers to raise the quality of health in medically underserved communities and to make sure everyone is cared for in the most culturally appropriate way. In order for community health centers to have the same health outcomes as the general population and save money, we need additional resources to provide supplemental services. If we improve health quality overall, we will save the system money. That is our firm belief. 
don't you love the red shoes? <laughs> I did not know you could specialize in insurance when I went to medical school. And I have time left over. <laughs> Thank you. A little technically challenged here. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Um, wasn't that a great uh, presentation at lunch? Um, kind of moving, as uh, Via said. And um, it's about listening, isn't it? It's about listening to our patients. Um, I often tell my staff, patients don't care how much you know. They only want to know how much you care. And that's from the very beginning at when they approach the front desk to when the MA approaches them and when the physician uh, talks with them and when the billing staff works with them. They all need to know how much you care. And I think that is what the community health center movement is all about. I've actually been involved with community health centers, running community health centers for um, just about 20 years now. Um, but uh, I was first engaged with um, setting up rural health centers um, back in 1976. So um, it's been a long and passionate journey for me, and I, I would want to, not want to be anyplace else. It's um, an incredible opportunity. It is about community. It's about making a difference. Um, and um, I think that's what makes community health centers stand out. And I think you probably saw that in, in Via's presentation as well as uh, Robert's. So um, I am proud to be part of uh, the movement. The West Wyatt Community Health Center, um, as <clears throat> Danny said, was is a new organization. We're one of the newer health centers, um, whereas uh, Waianae has been around, what, almost 40 years? 40 years. 40 years. Um, West Hawaii's um, just eight, eight years. Um, but we've had a very fast rise because of the need in the community. So you can see we started with one site, three exam rooms. Um, just I was actually the sixth employee <clears throat> and just a few patients today. We have um, four sites. Um, 20 exam rooms, six dental operatories, a staff of you know 110, um, and this year we'll hit almost 50,000 patient visits. Um, those numbers up there from uh, 2012. Um, we're getting ready to do a groundbreaking on our newest site, um, which is on um, Hawaiian homelands, and uh, we're excited about that. That's going to be a um, phase one is 11,000 square feet medical, dental, and behavioral health. Um, so. It's all about need. It's about serving the needs of the community, and that's what we've been doing about. Um, presentation today is not about West Hawaii as much as it's about the patient-centered health home and what, how, how we've accomplished being, as you can see the bottom line there, the um, first community health center to receive NCQA level three recognition. Um, we're excited to have been that, but we didn't come here uh, or make that journey alone. And um, the Primary Care Association and um, organizations like YNI, um, and uh, Wamanalo Health Center and uh, Kali'i Palama Health Center were all part of that journey. Um, we just happened to get there first, um, but we didn't, so we had other things that went on too, um, but the Primary Care Association um, pilot project, um, we were part of the Beacon Community Project, which was on the Big Island, and um, also uh, we're part of a CMS demonstration program. So there's a lot of elements um, involved in getting us there. Um, we all hear about patient-centered health <laughs> medical home. I prefer to say health home. Um, I think we'll probably start seeing community home. Um, and we, we all know a lot of elements of it. I like two quotes. And the one there, every patient is the only patient, is one of those quotes that I think epitomizes what a patient-centered health home is all about. And um, it's, and I think that's what we heard today at lunch about listening and realizing that patient, that's who we put our focus on, and that's um, where we need to, and that's what a being patient-centered is all about. And, but it's understanding, and that's where the social determinants of health come in, it's understanding their values and being respectful and uh, responsive to what the cultural values are um, and those and the personal values and the family values of the patient. Um, and I think those are uh, uh, critical elements. 
The other quote, and you know, Dr. Don Berwick um, is a guru of patient-centered care, but nothing about me without me. That first time I heard that, it just hit me. Just said, that's what it's about. Um, and then that's more I read. I said, well, then that means you give in. And I had providers saying, well, we don't want whatever they want. And I said, no, 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 no. And that's why it doesn't mean you give the patient whatever they want. But it is about engaging them. It's about communicating with them. It's about informing them um, and uh, partnering with the patient. And that leads going through that, you know, you, you hear about motivational interviewing. That's often a, a term you hear. But that leads to a more engaged patient. It leads to a patient that has goals and that you can align with um, the provider's goals. And the, the patient is incentivized, if you will, to take action. And to me, that's what patient-centered health home is all about. Um, our journey, the West Hawaii Community Health Center, we decided back in 2009 to go down a patient-centered health home. And we looked at it, and that question there is, why do you do it? Well, for us, it was, we thought it was the right thing to do. There wasn't a question. It was the right thing to do. And I think anyone who goes down that journey needs to think about it, is it a journey? or is it a destination? Are you going for NCQA recognition or are you trying to transform how you're delivering care in a more um, appropriate and patient-centered way? For us, it was the transformation. And um, we felt that if we went down that and did that transformation and made those changes and became patient-centered in our delivery of care, we would ultimately achieve NCQA recognition if we chose to do it. Along the way, we had the primary care and the pilot project, uh, the four centers that I mentioned, and uh, VIA was part of that, and um, a number of other health centers. But we worked and did it together. And that was a conscious decision to make it a journey and a transformation and not a destination. And those of you in the hospitals, you know, we all have joint commission and, you know, you always prepare for that, that review that they're, and um, it's, uh, and then what happens afterwards? Well, you go back from the old ways. That's not what we're talking about here. This is about real transformation in the and it's ongoing, and it's about uh, continuous improvement. Um, we had to get commitment from the leaders. That's our board of direct, we're a nonprofit organization, our board, our senior leadership, and all the way down, and we pushed it all the way down. Um, we put a plan together, a work plan, and we looked for champions in, throughout the organization, and we communicated, communicated, and communicated, because that was the only way back in 2009, 2010, two, and that we were going to get people on board. And as we did, we were able to move forward. Our program design focused on complex patients. Um, we selected two diseases, and this was part of the pilot project. And we, we focused on diabetes and depression. And um, we were also looking, you've heard about triple aim. We set some metrics that were related to the triple aim. Um, so lower the, co the cost improve uh, patient satisfaction, and improve quality. And uh, the quality we focused on was diabetes, depression, and um, ER visits and uh, um, hospital visits. Um, for the West White Community Health Center, we developed an integrated team where we had a PCP. Uh, we have um, a lot of psychologists. Um, at that time, we had as many uh, behavioral health specialists as we had primary care because we were growing. Um, so we, they were heavily um, involved. And then we also have RN care coordinators, and we also have patient navigators who will go out into the community and work with the patients in the community. Um, so our team met weekly. and. Uh, I'm now, I, I'm going to gloss through a bunch of this because has anyone applied for NCQA recognition? Are they planning on doing it? Show of hands? No? Um, NCQA recognition is a time-consuming process. Um, 
And they have five standard, uh, six standards. 2014, they're gonna go down to five standards. And these next slides talk about each of those standards, about improving access. And I can talk about some of the things we did to improve access and um, extending hours, hiring additional um, providers, um, changing the um, templates, um, around population management, using your data to, um, and these are all the types of things that they expect. But for why we, you know, that was to meet those requirements of NCQA. But we always had to come back, and there's a couple times where you actually came back and said, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? And it was always about the patient, and it's about caring for the patient, and we had to step back and always remind ourselves about that. So um, while we, you know, under population management, using our, our data and tracking systems and our dashboards and looking for gaps in care, it, it worked, but we didn't want to lose our focus about why we're doing the recognition. Um, and I can only say that if you're gonna do that journey to do NCQA recognition, don't lose your focus. Don't get caught in just trying to meet the, the standards. Um, there's another standard, um, support self-care um, process about setting self-management goals and assisting the patient develop their care plans. That's something all providers do already. Um, we took it to another level. We t made sure that the MAs were, in, uh, medical assistants were involved with that, and we pushed it um, a little bit further and make sure that all of our staff were trained around motivational interviewing so that everyone was engaged in knowing what the goal was for the patient. Um, another area is plan and um, is the managed care and designing workflows. That was a big thing. That was a huge piece, designing the workflows in the, um, and defining roles and responsibilities within the uh, clinic. And um, so that everybody knew, when you have multiple people kind of sh sharing the care of the provider, of uh, the patient, excuse me, that we all, they all needed to know what their roles and responsibilities were so they didn't step on one another's toes, if you will. Um, and, so we focus on continuity of care within this clinic, within the center, and then we also focused on continuity of care externally with the hospital, specifically, um, and other, some of our other specialists, uh, specialty practices in the community. And developing that continuity of care so that the patient, that it was tr seamless to the patient. So when they did go to the hospital, they came back, and, and they, we knew what hap happened in the hospital, and similarly, the hospital knew, uh, this is Kona Community Hospital, the hospital knew what we were doing, and if there was, um, in fact, we're continuing to move forward. Um, in the next uh, month, we'll be having uh, interface, electronic interface with uh, Kona Community Hospital. So we're excited about that, because that's gonna be sharing stuff. Right now, it's facts, you know? It's going up to the hospital, and going to their um, discharge planning meetings, and you know, it's, it's personal like that, which you need to develop that. Hopefully with the electronic aspect of it, we will um, be able to move forward. Um, tracking, continuity of care, um, those are all at critical aspects of um, preparing for and developing the materials for NCQA recognition. Um, but it's, it's more than that. It's also about knowing that you you can follow a patient through throughout the system. Um, again, exchanging patient information with our various um, support groups and um, from the home health agencies to specialists to the hospital and also other community organizations. Um, I'm going to I'm going to get to this one: uh, measurable results through the. The project that we did with, the pilot project we did with the Hawaii Primary Care Association, we had a number of very significant, we think, very significant outcomes. We decreased the hemoglobin A1C by a, almost a full point. This was pre and post. 
and we tracked it for one year. So we had about 253 patients, I think, in the cohort. Um, it was a very significant drop. We decreased the PHQ-9. It's an indicator of depression from um, almost five points. Again, a very n significant drop. This one has always blown me away, and this was reducing ER visits by 62% for that population, and re a reduction in inpatient use by 29%. Um, that was, again, if we looked at it from the, when we started to the end, these were the, some of the numbers. Um, and we'll be put in the point, Primary Care Association will be putting out a uh, uh, manuscript in the, shortly to um, uh, explain what we've done and the impact that we've had through the um, pilot project. Um, at West Hawaii, we saw similar results. Um, so it was across the board with all th four other pilot projects. Patient experience, um, these were pa patient surveys. We focused on f th uh, four questions. Same day access, 81% said they had same day access. Um, healthcare provider listened to you, 90% felt that they were being listened to. Again, we heard that at lunch, the importance of that. They, 90, um, 90% said they were listened to, 94 said uh, set personal health goals, and then 94 felt like they got help coordinating the services, coordinating the services with other entities. That's the continuity piece. Um, for us, recognition, you know, we appointed a, a, a lead person, um, paid a lot of attention to detail for sure. Um, we networked with others. We went to numerous work workshops. We learned about it. Uh, we borrowed shamelessly and shared um, willingly. So um, it, it, uh, we went th it was an arduous process. I'll put, just put it that way. But it was worth it because we knew why we were doing it. It was about providing quality care um, to patients. And, and just end with this, you know, so even when you fall on your face, as we did multiple times through this process, um, you're still moving forward. So thank you. I think we have about 10 minutes uh, for those, any of you who have questions, we have a microphone up front. And if we can open it up for questions to the panelists. Uh, for all of you, my fear is that the demonization of the ER has also demonized urgent care. Not long ago, I got a letter saying, in order to better serve you, we're closing down the urgent care room, wherever. Uh, and it seems to me that there is uh, a lot of smaller medical responsiveness that when the five-inch centipede bites me on my face, I don't need to see a full-on ER. I don't need to see my primary care physician. If I have young kids, they're probably a gazillion little things. Uh, use of Skype, use of a, uh, a well-located place. The, the community health centers tend to be in the community, but sometimes you are farther away. And I'm just wondering if any of you see that this patient-centered overall care should include urgent care that's less than an ER, less than a primary care, less than ours, uh, but some way to get responsiveness uh, to even assure people that maybe they do need to spend an hour on the press number one, press number two phone thing to get an appointment, or or something else than that. It seems to me that urgent care is a part of our healthcare system, and the desire to reduce ER use inappropriately uh, has, has kind of pushed the urgent care off the map. I totally agree with you. And actually, in Waianae, we have, you know, Waianae started with an, as an emergency room. I don't like microphones. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, 
Anyway, uh, Waianae started as an emergency room. It started, you know, Waianae is out there on the leeward coast with one road that frequently shuts down, and, and still to this day. And when when the when the community health center was built 40 years ago, it really was just a, basically a two lane road, and the nearest hospital facility was was uh, you know an hour drive. Um, things have improved now with 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 modern technology, but not much. Um, and uh, it still takes to this day. It still takes about 35 minutes to get to the nearest emergency department. Um, and so. So the community demanded an emergency room, and a few times that we've actually uh, lost funding and, and had to consider closing it or closing hours, cutting back on hours, we just put out a press release and the community came in full force because they were they would not hear of us closing down the emergency room. So it's kind of the emergency room that people love to hate. Um, they love to complain about it, but they also you know will not allow us to ever even consider closing it down. What we do primarily, I mean, we save lives in our emergency room, we clearly do, but we also primarily provide a lot of urgent and care there. Um, and we have just recently completed an internal study where we um, analyzed our patients who use our emergency department versus um, outside emergency departments for low acuity care. And we found a tremendous difference in uh, the zip code where they live. And this was not surprising. So the patients who live in Waianae utilized our services, and the patients who lived in Kapolei, Waipahu, Wahiwa, North Shore, I mean, we have patients all over the place, but our main catchment area does extend into the um, central area. Um, and those patients were using uh, the outside hospital-based emergency rooms for their low acuity visits. So our response to that is actually increasing our own internal urgent care um, hours. And so we're taking our satellite clinics and, and we're we're actually going to be increasing our hours in, in our main uh, couple A clinic just for that purpose, because that is what the patient needs. And you're absolutely right. I mean, patient-centered care is really about what the patient wants. That, that's what I made the comment earlier about what constitutes inappropriate care. I mean, nothing's inappropriate in the eyes of the patient. If they're sick, they're sick. If they're scared, they're scared. If they want to be seen, they want to be seen. That's patient-centered care. But does it need to be in an expensive emergency room? No. It can be in an urgent care. So, so you're absolutely right. And that's absolutely the next step that we are fortunate to be able to be taking. We are going to be extending our hours in, in at least one of our satellite clinics to meet those needs. I'd just like to add, too, that um, and each community is a little bit different, and you have to adjust for each of those needs. And we don't, unfortunately, don't have an emergency room. <laughs> um, but um, one of the things, when we look at the West Hawaii Community Health Center look at patient-centered um, medical home or health home, it was, we focused on complex patients. And so when you talk about patient-centered and wrapping the, um, all, uh, developing an integrated team all around that patient, that was for those complex patients, the ones that are the high, um, uh, high utilizers, the high cost patients. For the urgent care, um, we have same-day access. We have a triage, um, and we're looking at actually moving into um, doing more of an open access where they can just show up. And um, and by the way, we I made sure we don't have a press one, press two, press three. We have an operator. It costs us more, but that's about being present and being available to the patient um, and trying to get them to the right place when they need it. So I think access is a huge issue, and I would absolutely agree with what Via is saying about um, urgent care definitely has a place and a role, and um, not everyone needs a patient-centered health care home team surrounding them. Um, and if we can provide that access um, to address that urgent issue, like a, a bite or wh whatever it might be, um, then we try to get them in immediately. And I think we're going to see more of that happening um, uh, and defining the, the populations. We've actually looked at hiring a, uh, a, someone just to take care of urgent care as part of the facility. Unfortunately, every time we hire somebody to do that, they get attached to the patients and they want to move into um, uh, you know, the um, out of urgent care. So. Um, that's a struggle from an uh, operations perspective, but um, we recognize that and there definitely is a role. Thank you. Any other questions that we might have? 
Is that Bruce? Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned a patient-centered medical home model there is a need, of course, to track the patients through uh, not only through your own health centers and your services, but also in emergency rooms and so forth. And I'm wondering how, how, how it's working in, in your health information systems. Are, are they compatible? Are you able to maintain a more comprehensive health record? Uh, Richard, for example, your, your facility there at Coma, are you, are you able to know when your patient is going to uh, one a community hospital and what sort of services? Is that an issue now, or are you working that out? Uh, it, it's not as much of an issue as it was um, eight years ago, it's, um, or even five years ago, because uh, we built the relationships. Um, is it simultaneous or instantaneous, I guess is a better word, or same day? Not necessarily. Um, that's part of the reason we send a um, one of our patient navigators or RN coordinators up to the hospital and, or make calls and say, is there a patient? There's other sides to that is that sometimes the patient doesn't identify themselves as a West Hawaii patient. They don't, they show up and they don't say who their PCP is. So that's a, a job, something we have to do, uh, better, you know, engaging the patient around that. Um, we are moving in terms of, because Kona Community Hospital, just as you know, Bruce, um, just implemented their electronic health record, um, we're going to be able to have access to it. The actual integration of our system with their system is a ways off. Um, we're talking about next spring, hopefully, that we can look at some HL7 interfaces for that. So there'll be a little bit more seamless. Right now, until we can actually have access to, um, there's HIPAA types of things, and you know, there's, uh, well, we won't get into it. There's challenges <laughs> accessing it. Um, so it would be nice if we all had the same system, but we don't. Um, we are actually, I'm working w with um, our network partners about how to integrate the Kona Community Hospital with our system. Um, but. Until that happens, we will get access to the um, Kona Community Hospital electronic health record. Oh, we've built the relationships so that we do participate in their discharge planning meetings. We get all the facts um, reports. So that's for us. But every community is different. And um, I think it's about building relationships and building, um, uh, looking at a system of care. Yeah, and, and you know, that's an excellent question. Um, if all the computer systems could talk together, wouldn't life be wonderful? Um, the, the EHRs don't talk to each other at all, and, and the interfaces are not as easy to build as one would think, and, and the IT directors are not working their magic fast enough for, for those of us who are not in IT. Um, that being said, the, the workaround that we've developed is, um, as I said, we've, we've actually formed relationships with all of the hospitals, and we get um, what they call ADTs. We get the admission discharge and... and um, what does T stand for? Thank you. Um, yeah. So we get those feeds directly every single morning. And, and I wish, you know, our, our director of care enabling services is actually here somewhere floating around, Teresa Gonzalez. She's extraordinary. Every morning she comes to work and she turns on her computer and she has the direct feeds from every single hospital, including, including well, including Wilcox, because we get everything from HH um, or uh, HPH. So uh, not too many of our patients are going to Wilcox. That's that's a good thing. Um, but but we do, we, and that's, that's the list that our, that our care enabling workers start calling. So in the morning, they get the list, they download the list, she, she gives it to her, her staff and they start making the phone calls. And those are the phone calls I'm referring to that I was addressing earlier. They call and say, why did you go to the ER? What, you know, what were the reasons you went? Are you okay? Uh, do you need a follow-up appointment? And so they're navigating the care, so to speak. They're arranging appointments for those patients who need a follow-up appointment. They're encouraging those appointments. Uh, they're actually accessing the patient's medical records so they can already see what the gaps in care are. They can see that if, you know, they haven't 
haven't seen their primary care provider for X number of years. They're behind on all of their preventive maintenance screens. They're scheduling their appointments right then and there. Um, they're noticing that a patient may be, you know, we had one patient that was utilizing polymomy's emergency room 30 times in a matter of six months. Um, when we looked that patient up, that patient had never been seen in our health center. So essentially, polymomy was their PCP, um, although they were capitated to us and we were paying the bills. So, you know, it, we basically assigned one single care coordinator to, you know, I'm joking, but to move into that patient's house. I mean, it's, it's cheaper to have a nurse living with that patient than it is for that patient to be utilizing that ER 32 times in six months. Um, so that is our workaround. It would be better if, if all the computers talk together, but, you know, that's, that's a little further down the line. I think we're out of time, um, unfortunately. I want to thank the panelists today uh, for sharing uh, the work that you do and the progress that you've made in transforming healthcare and, and health in your communities. Um, I know it's, it's tough work. Uh, it, it's an everyday struggle. Um, so we know that transform and transformation is not easy, and we really applaud the work that you have done. I want to thank the audience for joining us today um, to hearing the great work of the community health centers. Um, and please, the next session will begin, I think, in a, actually it should be beginning very shortly. So thank you again.